Hello everybody, it's Tanya and welcome to today's video. Today's video is going to be the first installment in a, in a new type of videos which I plan to start doing more on my channels, very reminiscent of what you see in editions of classics as introduction. So, I am going to title this new types of videos an introduction to um, a classic. And today, in our first installment, you will be getting an introduction to Hadji Murat by Lev Tolstoy. This is my Russian edition. I'm just showing off <laughs> my beautiful Russian edition, but I will put it down and right here you will see an English cover. The plan of today's video is going to be as follows. First, I will very briefly tell you what this novella is about. The second section will be dedicated to a historical background of the events of the novella, period in Russian history this novella describes. The third part of this video will be dedicated to how Leo Tolstoy wrote this novella, his, the process of writing it, because it wasn't all smooth, it was difficult and bumpy right for him, and it took him a lot of effort and research, and it's just, it's, it's a story on its own, so I am dedicating a whole section to it. Section number four will be dedicated to the main themes of the novella, the main topics it explores. Then I will tell you a short story about how this novella was published, and the last section will be dedicated to the reception of this novella. So it's going to be a long video but hopefully an interesting one. Let all of your worries go away, <laughs> get a beverage of your choice, and I hope that you're going to enjoy this video, because everything that is connected to this novella is fascinating. And when I was preparing for this video, I myself was in awe, so hopefully you also are going to enjoy. And now, let's get into it. So, what this novella is about. Haji Murat tells a story of a short episode in the Caucasian War. The Caucasian War was a war that the Russian Empire led in the beginning and all the way through the middle of the 19th century on the, on the North Caucasus. We will talk about it later in the video. In particular, this is a story of this one person. His name is Haji Murat. He's a real historical figure and he was a participant of this war. He was very famous, one of the finest jigits, which is like a horseman. People were composing legends about him even during his uh, lifetime. He changed his sides throughout the war a few times. At first he was fighting on the side of Avar Khanate, then he had a conflict there and he changed sides. He was a very famous figure in that war. And this novella tells a story about him. It's a short episode when Haji Murad comes to the Russian side because he had a conflict with Shamil, the leader of the Chechen people in that war. Uh, so he had a conflict with him and then he comes to the Russian side uh, for a particular reason. He wants to save his family and he hopes and he expects that the Russians will help him. Uh, and that's a story about that. I'm, I don't want to spoil you the story, so I will not tell you more, but that's like the arc and the premise of this novella. So now let's talk about the historical background of this novella. What happened? What was happening in Russia at that period? A small disclaimer. I myself am not very well versed in that part of Russian history because it's quite complicated. There were so many interests kind of intermixed uh, in that story. I do not have a very firm grasp on the situation, but I will give you an overall kind of story of what was going on. So in the beginning of the 19th century, parts of Georgia joined the Russian Empire. It happened as a result of Russo-Turkish War. In 1812, yet another Russo-Turkish War has ended. There were so many Russo-Turkish Wars, there were many of them. So one of them ended in, in 1812 uh, with the victory of Russia. And on May 28, 1812, the Treaty of Bucharest was signed, and in accordance with that treaty, uh, the western territories of Georgia, which used to be part of the Ottoman Empire, now became parts of the Russian Empire. 
A year later, in 1813, Russo-Persian War ended. This war lasted from 1804 until 1813. And as a result of this war, the Treaty of Gulistan was signed. And this treaty signified that certain parts of Dagestan, eastern Georgia, some parts of Armenia were separated from the Persian Empire and they became parts of the Russian Empire. So that's as a result of these two wars, the Russo-Turkish War and the Russo-Persian War, Russia has acquired some new territories in the southern Caucasus, like south of the Caucasus. But the main territory of the Russian Empire and these new lands were separated by the territory of the northern Caucasus, which belonged to the people of this, of this region. And some of them did sign their allegiance to the Russian Empire, but de facto they were still independent people. They, they, st they still live their independent lives. And partly their economy depended on raids raids of the, of the surrounding villages um, and those territories already were parts of the Russian Empire. The two main objectives that the Russian Empire had in the North Caucasus of that time was obviously first to secure the communication between the mainland of the Russian Empire and these new uh, territories that it acquired as a result of the Turkish and the Persian War. That was the first. And the second, they wanted to stop the raids. They wanted to calm the region down and stop the raids. So these were like the main reasons when, uh, the, Russian when the Russian Empire brought its troops to the Caucasus um, and the Caucasian War started. But actually it wasn't like a, as currently in the current uh, historiography, they describe it as one war, but actually it was just, it was a very long process consisting, some people separated, separated it into few Caucasian wars. The most active period of these military actions happened from 1817, and it lasted up until 1864. So it is considered the longest war in Russian history. The North Caucasian people, they were not like a one unity. There were many different kind of parties to it. Some of these parties sometimes fought on the Russian side, some of them sometimes fought like uh, against the Russians, sometimes they fought with each other. Like it's all like very complicated. I don't know well all of that. In 1825, the main opponent of the Russian military in the region becomes the so-called Caucasian imamate with Shamil as its leader and as its head. And Shamil is one of the characters in Hajj Murat. You will, you will see him in Hajj Murat. So he is important. He is the leader of the Chechen uh, nation because there were many, many nations in Caucasus. So Chechen, Dagestan, many, many, many. So he was one of them. In the mid 1930s, the conflict escalated because Shamil turned it from just a military conflict, he turned it into a religious conflict because now he had this idea of the holy war against um, the infidels, the infidels being the Russian side. So that also complicated and escal escalated the conflict. But in 1859, the resistance of the Chechen people and the Dagestan people was suppressed by the Russian army, uh, and Shamil, uh, he gave himself to the Russian army. So uh, the conflict with the Chechen part of the, co of the whole Northern Caucasus and Dagestan has ended, but there were other people, Circassian, uh, I think the Eng their English name is Circassian people, who were still active and they were still defending their lands. The conflict with them continued until 1864 and it ended with the forced relocation of these people from the North Caucasus to the Ottoman Empire. 
Like I said, this Caucasian war is considered the longest war in Russian history, as well as it is very often, as well as in Haji Murad, it is very often criticized for actions of Russian army in the region, um, how they treated the local soldiers, how they burned the villages, how they cut the, the woods. Certain parts of this war are described as genocide, for example, the genocide of this uh, Circassian people. Um, obviously, you will find different sites in like historical literature on that, like some Russian sources, they would defend the Russian part, some the opposite don't, and they very harshly criticize this war and the action of the Russian army. So it's not exactly like um, a proud episode in the Russian history. And Tolstoy in Haji Murad, he also, he doesn't take sides here. He, you, the, one of the themes of this novella is the critique of what the Russian army did and how the Russian army behaved, but it's just one theme. He doesn't really take sides here. He doesn't take sides neither with the Caucasian people, he doesn't take sides with the Russians, with the Russian army. He tries to be um, objective. So that was a very brief overview of the Caucasian War in Russian history, because Haji Murad takes place during the Caucasian War, and Haji Murad himself is a participant of the Caucasian War. Now, Leo Tolstoy. Lev Tolstoy. Lev Tolstoy participated in the Caucasian War for a short period of time. He was in Caucasus uh, for two and a half years. But this time played a big part in his development as a writer and a thinker. Later on in life, he was remembering this period of his life, and he was saying that even though he was unhappy in, when he was in Caucasus, and it was a painful time in his life, he also said that it was a good time. Because, as he said, never, either before or after, has I reached that height of thought. Now, everything I had found back then became my conviction for the rest of my life. But how it all started? So, it was year 1851. Leo Tolstoy was a young man. He was only 23 years old at that time. And up until that point, he had been living his life pretty much carelessly in a society of rich people. Uh, he was just enjoying his life playing cards, attending balls, living in a big city, very carelessly. According to some sources, he lost in cards. And because of this, uh, because of this loss, he was forced to leave the city. It was just like one source of information that I found. In other sources, they say that he just decided to change his life. He wanted to have a more some, to have something more meaningful to do, because up until then he didn't have anything. He wrote in his uh, diary later on that, and he acknowledged that back then he had lived carelessly, without a civil service, without things to do, without a goal. And eventually he decides to change his life and, together with his brother, Sergei, go to Caucasus. On May 30th, 1851, the two brothers reach the village Staroglodkovskaya. In the evening of the same day, we find this entry in Leo Tolstoy's diary. He writes, How did I end up here? I don't know. Why? I don't know that either. His first impression of this village, Staroglodkovskaya, uh, was very disappointing. He expected the, this mountain region, this Caucasian mountainous region of Russia, to be something very beautiful, picturesque, impressive. Uh, but the village itself was located in the deep between mountains, as he also wrote it in his in his diary, like it's in the deep between mountains, mountains, and there are no views. And he was really disappointed. He he that he said he wrote that he was expecting to see something beautiful, uh, but it wasn't. 
Lucky for him, in a week, he and his brother were relocated to a Chechen village. Stary Yurt, the name of the village. From that village, in summer 1851, Tolstoy participated in his first raid of the Chechen side of the conflict. It was he volunteered for that raid. Right after it, uh, in his diary, we find an entry that he decides to write a novella, which which working title was Four Epochs of Development. And later on in his life, this title turned into childhood, boyhood, and youth. In August 1851, Tolstoy and his brother returned to the village Staroglatkovskaya, so the village which he was disappointed in. And this time around, he actually starts to enjoy it. He starts to learn more about lifestyle of the Cossacks, so the local kind of Russian people who were living in the village. Cossacks is like the, the Russians, it's the Russian side. They were uh, also they also participated in the in the war and they uh, participated in the war on the Russian side the Russian but they are free people they never knew served them so these were very free, free people and Tolstoy was actually really impressed with them because they're simple people but they were free people who had never knew slavery he was especially impressed with women uh, because they always spoke their mind and like he, he also wrote about them like how they have kind of a little bit like masculine character to them because they were so independent and yeah always spoke their mind he liked their independent character during that time in that village he starts to learn the local language language he starts writing down the chechen folk songs and chechen folk stories as well as he starts to learn to Jigitavati. Jigitavati is like a, to ride a horse, but I guess it's like a local kind of way of riding a horse. So he learns to be a Jigit, which is like a horseman. Because you see, like when the, this war happens, and yes, it was a war between Russian and the Chechen, but the way I understand it, all of these villages and all of these people, like the Cossacks, the Chechen people, the Dagestan people, they're like, they were so close to each other. And like people themselves, had no problems with each other like most of the time they had nothing to hate each other for so they would come to each other to sell something to buy something to there would be constant con uh, contacts between them like contacts between the Cossacks, contacts uh, contacts between the chechen people um, and those contacts were not hostile uh, so the theme again one of the themes of haji murat was that people, like the normal, like the simple people, have nothing to hate each other for. The war is caused by the people in power. And it's the critique of the people in power and their decisions. So that's why in Tolstoy's diary, you, you, you see, like, he, he writes how he met Chechen people, how he learns to jigitavat. Um, he had a friend among Chechen people, he had friends among the Cossacks. Like, it's a very, actually, closely tight community and very friendly community, actually. And he really enjoyed his time there. Uh, among of his closest friends, there was one old, like, very elderly, 90 years old uh, Cossack. His name was Yepifan Sinichin. Yepifan Sinichin. He was a hunter, he was uh, living in this village, and he really took liking of Tolstoy. So they went hunting together, they would cook together, they would eat together. Like, they really liked each other quite a bit. And later on, people who lived in this village with this Yepifani Sinichin, uh, they remembered him later on, and they uh, always said that like he was a very simple man, he was a very friendly man, he would never be angry with anybody, only sometimes he called people swines. <laughs> That's like the thing that he could sometimes tell about people, that they were swines. That's like the worst, uh, like the height of his anger, I guess. <laughs> um, and yeah, he really liked Tolstoy, and they hunted together, and uh, one of, like, this Yepifani's simple philosophies of his life was that, like, well, we are living now, now we should enjoy our life, we should, like, you know, hunt, um, have fun, 
uh, be kind to people, and then we will die. But up until then, just enjoy your life. And another piece of his philosophy was that what is this war for? We could just visit each other as we had done before. We could just, you know, um, sell things to each other, visit each other as we had done before. Uh, this war is unnecessary. So that was the Epiphanes philosophy. Very simple man, 90 year old. Um, yeah, one of the Tolstoy's best friend in that period of his life. Another his best friend was a Chichen young man. Ch this uh, young man's name was Sado Misarbiev. Sado Misarbiev. Uh, Sado is his first name, Misarbiev his last name. He often came to the Russian garrison and to this village where the garrison was staying uh, to play cards. <laughs> But the thing is, he um, didn't know how to write and he didn't know how to count. And that's why other officers, like Russian officers, would cheat him. They would always cheat him. Tolstoy, like, really disliked it and he never played against Sado. And he said that they cheat you, like, they really cheat you bad. Uh, you should stop playing. But Sado couldn't stop playing and then Tolstoy offered him to play instead of him, which Sado was like very grateful for. And after that, they became friends and Sado, to express his gratitude that Tolstoy was playing instead of him to prevent the cheating, uh, he gave him a purse. And Tolstoy, in exchange for that purse, give, gave Sado his old, kind of very cheap pistol. But in the Chichen kind of tradition of that time, uh, there was this rule that once people have exchanged gifts, uh, like they can become uh, kunik. I think the word was kunik. Kunik is uh, like a friend in the local language. So to become to become friends. But in order to become like real friends, uh, because again, real friend in that understanding is a person who can give you everything. Like if you want. Uh, his house, his house is your house. His wife is your wife. I don't know. Don't ask. Don't ask. Um, his horse is your horse. His armor is your armor. And vice versa. Like, your house is his house. Your armor is his armor. I don't know about the wife. Uh, but it's... I mean, I read. It's not... I didn't come up with it. They exchange gifts. The second kind of ritual that they had to go through was um, for them to eat together in uh, each other's houses. So... Uh, Sado invites Tolstoy to his house, they share a meal together, uh, and then Sado gives him one more gift, which was uh, like a sword, but, uh, kind of like an expensive kind of sword. And then Tolstoy also gave him his um, silver watch. So they exchanged gifts and they became kuniks. I, I think the word is kunik, but basically friends. And there was also later on episode in Tolstoy's life when his horse died, and Sado, when he learned about that, he offered Tolstoy his horse, which he didn't, Tolstoy didn't want to accept it, but Sado, he said, like, you will offend me if you don't take this horse, and so Tolstoy took his horse. So, yeah, basically, they, they became very close friends. So, you see, like, people, like, on the ground, when you, like, live on the ground, people have nothing against each other. Russian, Chechen, Cossacks, they were all kind of friends. And they could live very peacefully, if not the people in power. Tolstoy greatly enjoyed his life in Caucasus. And he starts to realize back then that happiness consists of two things. The first thing is being close to nature and living close to nature. And the second thing is uh, being of serv service to others. So basically living your life as a service to other people. So these two components were like the components of a happy life for him, and that he understood dur during his life in Caucasus. The Cossack's lifestyle was also very close to Leo Tolstoy, and it was like the ideal type of life and so kind of society in his eyes. And later in his diary, he wrote that um, Russia's future are the Cossacks. Freedom, equality, and, obligat and, and obligatory military service for everyone. With all of that, having friends and enjoying his life and enjoying the magnificent mountains, which he also wrote about in his diary, um, 
beautiful people because also in his diary he describes the Chechen women and he wrote that they have beautiful faces, they have also very beautiful complexion and he enjoys watching them wash the clothes because they were washing the clothes with like their feet he describes like they would stamp like they would stamp stamp on the um on the clothes you know like in the in the hot spring and they would tuk, 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 that's how they wash their clothes and he was like imagine like beautiful chichen women mountains i can watch this for hours <laughs> he wrote in the diary uh so yeah even though like he enjoyed all of that at the same time, he also understood that he was a stranger there. He could never become the Cossack. He could never become a Chechen villager. And at the same time, he, the company of the Russian officers there was also alienating to him because they were mostly drinking and they were mostly playing cards. Uh, and he didn't want to participate in any of that. One of the officers who was serving his time with Tolstoy, he remembered Tolstoy, and that's what he said. He was proud. When everyone was drinking and playing, he would sit alone by himself and read a book. I often saw him like that, always with a book. Tolstoy was on military service when he was in Caucasus, so he participated in a few battles that happened uh, during the that time in Caucasus and he did show himself as a brave soldier, as a fearless soldier and at some point in one battle he was almost killed by a um, cannonball and there was there was also an entry in his diary where he said that just imagine if this cannon would have been like turned just a little bit uh, and the cannonball would have just a slightly different direction uh, like his life could be over. And also at that time uh, of his life, Tolstoy starts to really think about his path in life, about what he wants to do. And then we encounter this entry in his diary. I'm 24 years old and I haven't accomplished anything yet. I feel that I have been fighting my doubts and passions for eight years for a reason. But what am I meant for? Only future will show. A few days later, in a different entry in a diary, in a like new entry in his diary, he also writes, I have to work intellectually. I know that I would be happier not knowing this work, but God has put me on this way. I should follow it. Well, that's how Leo Tolstoy started to realize his purpose in life, I guess, and the fact that he was meant and he needed to become a writer. And Caucasus, his time in Caucasus, played a big part in this understanding. Now let's discuss how Leo Tolstoy wrote Haji Murat. Haji Murat was his last work that he wrote, uh, his last work of fiction. He wrote it already in his last years of his life. So it, he didn't write it during his time in Caucasus. This uh, novella was on his mind throughout his whole life because he learned about this one episode about Haji Murat. He was impressed with it. Uh, and the figure of Haji Murat never left his mind. And so he was thinking about this character and he was thinking about the story throughout his whole life. He starts writing this novella on August 10th, 1896, almost 50 years after his time in Caucasus. As he describes in like the very... It's not really a chapter. It, it's like a first maybe chapter, kind of like introduction. Um, he describes how he came up with this story. He was walking in the kind of on the lands of his brother's estate um, and he saw a plant a burdock plant i think this is this plant bird i think the english title is the english name of this plant is burdock that's what i found in the dictionary if it's something else it's this plant russian name is chertopaloch that plant was so ragged it was you could see that 
many a people has has stamped on it many a carriages had run over it but it was still standing it was still alive um, and after that walk he comes back to his house and in his diary we see an entry which says Tatarin on the road Hadji Murat so that is how he started working on the novella. Tolstoy has had been familiar with the story of Haji Murad for the for the long time. He was on, in Caucasus when this happened, but he never met Haji Murad in person. He only read about him from the newspapers. So first let's discuss Haji Murad. As I have already mentioned, Haji Murad was a real historical figure, a real participant of the Caucasian war. At first, he was fighting on the side of the Avar Khanate. Uh, he was an Avar leader. Avar is like a nation. But at some point, he had a conflict with the Ahmed Khan, Sultan, the local Sultan Ahmed Khan, and he changed sides and he went to the Shamils army. So he joined the Chechen side of the conflict. Uh, and he became very famous, he became very notorious for his daring raids of the Russian Gorisons. Uh, he received a nickname uh, Phantom, or another translation I guess would be Ghostly. Russian it's uh, Prizrichny. So like phantom or ghostly for his ability to suddenly and unexpectedly out of nowhere appear, have the raid, and then just as quickly and as unexpectedly disappear. Like a pfft. So that was Haji Murad. And uh, people were composing legends about him even during his lifetime. But in fall 1851, uh, Shamil and the Chechen side of the conflict had rough time and Shamil blamed all of the military failures on Haji Murat and he took Haji Murat's family hostage. And then after that happens on November 23, 1851, Haji Murat changes his sides and he goes to the Russian side expecting that Russians would give him, um, like soldiers, would give him armor uh, to fight against Shamil. Um, Leo Tolstoy, as you already know, was a young officer, just came to, to the Caucasus, and he read the story about Haji Murat's transition to the Russian side. He read it in a newspaper. And then he wrote in a letter to his brother Sergei. That's what he said. Uh, he wrote it on December 23, 1851. He wrote to his brother Sergei and he says, he, Haji Murat, is the fine, is the first Jigit, Jigit uh, horseman, and the finest fellow in all of the Chechen people, but has committed such an infamy. So as you can see from this quote, Tolstoy wasn't impressed with what Haji Murat has done, how he has changed sides. He uh, disapproved of it and he saw, um, he saw no dignity in it and he saw no, he saw it as a dishonest behavior. But throughout his life, his attitude towards Haji, Mur towards Haji Murat changes. And he saw Haji Murat's decision uh, and doing from a different light, from a different perspective, which you will see in this novella. Later in his estate, Yasnaya Palyana, uh, he had a school for children and he would tell them stories about Chechen bandit, Haji Murat. Even after he came from this war, he would still remember that character. Uh, and he starts reading everything he can find about Haji Murat. At first he had uh, limited sources. He started with a collection of information about the Caucasian warlords, like, like a rough translation of the book. Uh, Zbornik Svedeni o Kavkazskich Gorzach. That's the Russian title. 
and also he read the memoirs of Poltaratsky. So Poltaratsky was um, an officer and he is also uh, present as a character in Haji Murat. So he read his memoirs. So ma majority of the characters in this novella are real people. Like these are real people who lived, existed and participated in the events. So Pol Poltaratsky is one of these characters. So at first Tolstoy wanted to write just a short story about Haji Murat and the short story was supposed to be titled Burdock, so the plant. But uh, because he wanted to be thorough and he wanted to be precise and true to facts, he was researching more and he was finding more and more information on this episode in the, in the war. Um, and the story of Haji Murad grew. Uh, Tolstoy wrote in his diary, whenever I am writing something historical, I love being true to facts, down to every last detail. Even for his first draft of this story, he studied 5,000 pages worth of material and different historical documents, archived, published documents, were represented in the, in the draft of this first kind of short story slash novella. Some of his sources, some of the sources that he used were, of course, books by Arnold Lvovich Zisserman. Zisserman was a historian who wrote mostly about the Caucasian War. So Tolstoy studied his works, as well as I have already mentioned, memoirs of uh, Vladimir Poltaratsky, who later became one of the characters in this book, as well as uh, different other like documents and books, like many of them, I, I cannot translate all the titles, looked a lot, as well as he uh, interviewed people who were the eyewitnesses of this event. And actually also in the first chapter of this novella, he writes, I remembered a Caucasian episode of years ago, which I had partly seen myself, partly heard of from eyewitnesses, and in part imagined. So that gives you like a feeling of what, of what uh, this novella is. Uh, it is a historical document, partly Tolstoy's imagination, but it's very realistic. It's one of his uh, most praised realistic works. It is often compared to Pushkin's Captain's Daughter. Like Pushkin and Tolstoy were the two authors who were very thorough in their research whenever they wrote something historical. Pushkin was uh, researching a lot about Pugachev's uprising when he was writing Captain's Daughter, as well as Tolstoy was researching crazy amounts when he was writing War and Peace. Uh, and also Haji Murad. And Haji Murad, by many people, is considered the top of his like realistic uh, literature, his realistic work. The majority of the characters in, in this novella are real people um, who really participated in the events that happened to Haji Murad. So first, obviously, Haji Murad, a real person. Uh, Nikol Nikolai I, so the Russian emperor at the time. Shamil obviously. Uh, Varantsov, the kind of the general, the main general, who was like the one of them, there were like, because the war was so long, like the main leaders of like the Russian army changed. First it was Yermolov, then was uh, somebody else, then Varantsov, then somebody else. I don't remember their names. Uh, Yermolov was really very harshly criticized for the way he uh, conducted the military actions, actually, like the in the the last actions were also criticized. Um, so, but yeah, so Varantsov, the third leader of the Russian army, uh, was also a real person, as well as the characters that are described in this novella from uh, Nicholas the uh, First administration. Uh, so we have 
the Minister of War, Alexander Ivanovich Chernyshov, uh, Governor General of South East Region, and later he became uh, Minister of Home Affairs. That was Dmitry Gavrilovich Bibikov. Uh, Minister of the Imperial Court, Petr Mikhailovich Volkonsky, uh, as well as Shamil's people, who were described in the novella, uh, Shamil's teacher, Jamal Edin, and his advisors, um, Zaidet and Aminet. So, and also like other characters, like Voltaratsky that we have already talked about, and some other officers were all real people. In winter 1897, half in half a year after Tolstoy finished his first draft of this novella, he was able to meet uh, General Konstantin Diterichs. I hope I pronounced correctly. Diterichs, Diterichs, Diterichs. Um, and from him, he was able to learn everything about, about the way Haji Murat looked, about his portrait, how he behaved, uh, how he... Yeah, just basically his portrait. Uh, and let me read you the portrait from the, from the novella. On his way back to rejoin Vorontsov, Poltaratsky noticed behind him several horsemen who were overtaking him. In front, on a white maned horse rode a man of imposing appearance. He wore a turban and carried weapons with gold ornaments. This was Haji Murat. He approached Poltaratsky and said something to him in Tartar. Raising his eyebrows, Poltaratsky made a gesture with his arms to show that he didn't understand and smiled. Haji Murat gave him smile for smile. And that smile struck Poltaratsky for, for its childlike kindliness. Poltaratsky had never expected to see the terrible mountain sh chief look like that. He had expected to see a morose, hard-featured man. And here was a vivacious person whose smile was so kindly that Poltaratsky felt as if he were an old acquaintance. He had only one peculiarity. His eyes sat wide apart, which gazed from under their black brows calmly, attentively, and penetratingly into the eyes of others. So that's the description of Haji Murat you find in the novella. In February 1894, Leo Tolstoy was preparing a short excerpt from, his, from this novella for a publication abroad in a foreign literary journal. The excerpt was called Hazabat. The main character Haji Murat there was represented as a kind of religious fanatic who was professing an idea of war against the infidels. However, Tolstoy was left unsatisfied with this portrayal of the character of Haji Murat. Later in his um, diaries, he wrote an entry that he described his principle, which he called kaleidoscope. And this principle allowed him to look at people and his characters from different angles and different perspectives. Uh, it, can, it allowed him to make his characters more multifaceted and more complex. And he wants to apply this, to, this principle to Haji Murad because he didn't want to reduce the man to just one idea. He wanted uh, him to be something more complex, which people usually are more complex than just one idea. So that uh, was a moment when the character of Haji Murad started to become more multifaceted. And Tolstoy realized that he needed to search for even more historical information on the man. As a result of such work, the novella had 10 drafts with multiple variants of those drafts. But from 1898 until 1901, uh, there wasn't a single entry in Tolstoy's diaries about Haji Murat. So he wasn't working on Haji Murat uh, in these three years of his life. 
partly the reason was uh, probably that he was researching, so he was maybe looking for more information on Haji Murad. Uh, another reason was that he was working on his um, resurrection, on his novel Resurrection, and um, on the no on the play um, The Living Corpse. So these three years, Haji Murad was not in the picture. But also the reason was the complication of the initial plan. So now this novella became not only a story of Haji Murat. Now he decided to include more characters. So this, he, this, he developed the story. Um, and now Shamil and Nikolai I also became the characters, uh, which meant more research, <laughs> more research for Leo Tolstoy. In 1901, Tolstoy returns to writing uh, Haji Murat. And uh, again, you can see different entries in his diary. So he writes, Sometimes I write eagerly, sometimes reluctantly, and with shame. Or a different entry. Today I have been writing well, two chapters. Or on the contrary, um, I have worked poorly today. Again, I've lost all of my vigor. On June 29, 8, 1902, Tolstoy wrote a letter to his brother Sergei, and also he writes in this letter, I'm currently writing an address to the working class. When I finish it, I want to finish the story of Haji Murat. It's just trifling and foolishness, but since I've already started it, I'd like to finish. Somewhere else he also wrote, uh, I feel bad wasting time writing such trifles. So many a times Leo Tolstoy tried to just give up this story and just stop writing it and give up on it completely. But then he would always come back, he would rewrite some parts, change something. So he just couldn't give up. A real breakthrough happened on December the 20th. 1902, when uh, Ivan Karganov, a son of the head of like the administration of a town in Caucasus, uh, wrote to Tolstoy. His father was a guard of Haji Murat. So when Haji Murat was on the Russian side, when he joined the Russians, you will know from the novella that, you know, they were guarding him, they were careful. And so he would kind of have guards around him. The father of this Ivan Karganov was one of the guards at that time. And so Ivan Karganov learned from a newspaper that Leo Tolstoy was working on a story about Haji Murat. And he wanted to help him. Luckily for Lev Tolstoy, he was able to talk to Ivan and to his mother as well and to learn everything he could uh, about Haji Murat, about the house that he was kept in, about his behavior, about how religious he was, about how well he spoke Russian, uh, just how he behaved in general with people. So all of those small details. And later on, all of them were represented and used in this novella. As you can tell, Tolstoy was really very thorough to be true to facts and to be true to uh, the real historical figure, be true to real facts. But he also did take some liberties. So two of the liberties that kind of sources give is that there was a story in novella that Haji Murat's father would um, beat his mother because his mother refused to become a milkmaid for he, uh, Khan, Khan, he, Khan, what is the English? Um, you know, Khan's children. And another, another thing that he, he omitted mentioning of Haji Murat's uh, multiple wives. So in, in the Caucasian people, they were all Muslims, so they did have multiple wives. And, and I think he omitted that um, because he didn't want Haji Murat to be mixed with Shamil. Because again, one of the themes of this novella is the critique of the people in power. Uh, critique of their luxurious lifestyle, of their indulgences. And Shamil's multiple women were represented as uh, his indulgences. And because Tolstoy wanted to omit this with Haji Murat, 
even though like in reality Hajimrat also had multiple wives. Um, he omitted mentioning of that. So in the novella, Haj uh, we hear only about one wife of Hajimurat, his mother, his one wife, uh, his son and daughter. So Hajimurat became one of the most demanding texts for Tolstoy. He had to research a lot, he had a lot of doubts, he multiple times he wanted to give up, but he would always come back. And he he made multiple drafts of this work. He would never uh, separate from it. He wouldn't separate from it and he would continue working and refining it up until uh, his last day in Yasna Palyana, his, his estate. Up until October 28, uh, 1910. So that's the story of how Leo Tolstoy wrote this novella. Now let's talk about the main themes that this novella explores. And the main overarching, kind of the big picture that you see in this novella is the critique of absolutism. Is it, is it absolutism in English? I hope it's absolutism. The characters of Nikola, Nikolai I and Shamil, the two leaders on the opposite sides, they are representatives of the same problem to Tolstoy. They are not against each other. They kind of like co complement each other. So Nikolai I represents the Western absolute power, the Western absolutism. Shamil represents Eastern absolutism. And he shows actually how both of these characters are very similar. That's why you can see that he is not taking sides. He is not for Chechen people. He is not for the Chechen side. He is not for the Russian side. Because both sides for him are at fault in this war. Both of them are to blame for this war. And not people, but the monarchs. Well, Shamir wasn't a monarch, but he was the leader of the, of the Chechen people. Alstoy shows how both of them are very ambitious how both of them lead this luxurious lifestyle, how they, how self-indulgent they are, how selfish they are, how they start this war and they lead this war driven by their own pride, driven by their own ambition, and how they send regular people who have nothing against each other, to die, to die for their own ambition, how they sacrifice people to their own pride. He also shows how this military action in Caucasus solve no problem. They, don't, they didn't solve any problem. They would, they would only create more hatred. They would only entail tragic consequences, causing people to separate and causing people to endlessly fight each other. Uh, there is a very tragic 17th chapter, 17th chapter in this book, where um, the devastation of an Aul is shown, the devastation by the Russian army. And there is a very heart-wrenching description of like how people felt. Uh, and it was very powerful. Let me read it to you. So the extract, <laughs> To be honest, even like for me, it's uh, it's hard to read, uh, but I will read you part part of it, only part of it. So at first, there goes a description of the devastated village or Aul, as they call it, like the dead bodies of children, uh, the ruined houses, women crying, so all of that. And then he writes like it's more even interesting that Tolstoy wrote it, like. A Russian officer wrote it, um, and it's like it's really like even for me, like reading it is like, like you know. Okay, I will read it to you. So goes the description of the devastation, and then he writes. No one spoke of hatred of the Russians. The feeling experienced by all the Chechens, from the youngest to the oldest was stronger than hate. It was not hatred, for they didn't regard those Russian dogs as human beings, 
but it was such repulsion, disgust, and perplexity at the senseless at the senseless cruelty of these creatures that the desire to exterminate them, like the desire to exterminate rats, poisonous spiders, or wolves, was as natural an instinct, an instinct as that of self preservation. I feel like this passage is like really, like it hits, at least like me as a Russian, <laughs> it hits. Um, but Tolstoy wrote it, a Russian officer wrote it. So even like from that short uh, quote, you can tell that he is not like, he definitely isn't defending the Russian side because he even like during his war during his participation in the war he disapproved of the actions and like how the russian army was treating the local people and how the military actions were conducted because the devastations like that devastation of that owl apparently were like a common practice and Tolstoy criticizes that so that's like another theme criticizing the way the military actions were conducted with like no respect to your enemy so the main and the overarching theme obviously is that of war of people that cause the war those people being the people in power um, of the way the war is conducted by you know people of lower rank but you know like generals who conducted the military actions but there were also um, other teams, like for example, that of family. Because um, for Haji Murat, the main cause of his behavior, the main reason that forced him in this novella to join the Russian side was his family. He wanted to save his family from Shamil because he knew what Shamil, Shamil would do to them and he needed support and that's why he joined the Russians. Allegiance to your family. Twice in this novella Haji Murat chooses his family instead of his life or um, instead of his honor. He chooses family. Even above his honor. Because changing sides, you know, it's not an honorable thing to do. That's what Yang Tolstoy criti criticized Haji Murat for, for ch changing his allegiances so easily. But then in this novella, he does it for his family. And that's what um, justifies him. So being uh, faithful to your family, giving your life for your family. How family is the most important thing, by far the most important thing that anybody can ever have. That's another theme of the novella. Another, th another theme is the lifestyle of the local people and the local people themselves, the Chechen themselves. And um, majority of Chechen characters here, uh, if you don't count like Shamil and his people who are next to him, majority of the Chechen people here are brave and honorable and honest men. Like you read the first chapter where uh, Haji Murat comes to Sado, uh, to his sakle, to his house, um, because he is on the run from Shamil, and how Sado understands that if now he helps Haji Murat, he can be uh, taken by the Shamil forces and he can be killed, he can be punished, but he does it anyway because of the honor, because it's the right thing to do. And it's described in this book how when he does it and he understands that he's doing the right thing, how good it makes him feel because he has chosen the right thing to do. So the moral question of being not only uh, true to your family, but also to your friends is also a really big part and uh, it is shown a lot in particular in the Chechen people in the characters of Chechen not so like not really so much Russian side but mostly Chechen people in this novella so moral choice local lifestyle and local traditions of 
uh, you know, inviting your guest, uh, treating your guest like your guest is your king, kind of, you know, this Eastern kind of hospitality, like your guest is your king. Uh, all of it is shown. As well as the topic of self-sacrifice, self-sacrifice first of all, and obviously, of course, in the character of Haji Murat, uh, but also Sado and his family. So all of these like main themes, family, lifestyle, honor, uh, tradition, moral choice, uh, war, um, critique of the absolute power, critique of self-indulgent lifestyle, critique of uh, pride, of people in power. All of these themes find their representation in this novella. And it's beautiful. It's it, it's strong. It, it is strong. Now let's talk about the publication a little bit. So how it was published. There isn't much story to it, but basically after Tolstoy's death in 1910, all of his papers were given to his friend, Vladimir Grigoryevich Chertkov. Along with Pavel Boulanger, Chertkov were preparing like posthumous collection of Tolstoy's work. And Haji Murat was uh, supposed to be included in this collection. Before like the mass publication, Chertkov brought first books to the authorities for them to like to censor to check the books if they you know contain some undesirable kind of information and descriptions it was done just uh, to prevent confiscation of the books after they have already been published like m as a mess that would be a huge loss so in order to prevent them he brought the books for censorship the censorship was performed by the head of main directorate for press affairs alexei bilgard uh, and as you can guess uh, since i've already told you that nikolai the first wasn't portrayed there very favorably bilgard of course of course found certain parts that were illegal as he has named them, they were illegal, and they subjected Nikolai I to unacceptable and extremely rude and offensive to his memory attacks. And as a result of this reviewal and of this censorship, the chapter about Nikolai I was reduced two times, so it became two times shorter. Out of ten pages, it became four and a half pages. Uh, and also, the 17th chapter, where the devastation of this Aul, which I have recently quoted to you, was described, that part that I read to you. So from that whole chapter, it's like a big chapter, um, from that whole chapter, only one sentence was left, the first sentence, that the Aul that was devastated by the army was the Aul of Sado, so the men whom Haji Murad came to before his transit to the Russian side. So the first, only the first sentence was left. In full, the novella was published only in 1950. Uh, so that edition was already based on uh, Tolstoy's own papers, Tolstoy's own writing, and there were removed all the mistakes of people who rewrote this novella like before because they made some mistakes. So like the complete text was only published in 1950. Now how this novella was received after the publication. Uh, at first it was received quite coolly and not very favorably. Vasily Razanov, who was a, also like a writer of kind of short kind of feuilletons, he considered Tolstoy's last works, including Hadji Murat, to be quite weak. And uh, in particular pages about Nikolai I in Hadji Murat novella, he considered them shameful. Another writer, Alexei Suvorin, that was his quotation about uh, Hadji Murat. He wrote, Against Captain's Daughter by Pushkin. What is this worth? It's bullshit. That's like two very negative 
very negative kind of perceptions of Haji Murata. But later on, reception improves much like significantly. Like by now, you can very in many many uh, sources and by many people, you see that people consider it Tolstoy's best work, like best work among like his realistic and his fiction work. So, for example, uh, Mark Aldanov, who was also a writer, told to Ivan Bunin, the great Russian literature ended with Hadji Murat. So he included Hadji Murat in the great Russian literature. Also, Isaac Babel, who was another writer, recommended this novella as an example, as an exemplary novella to learn how to write simply yet powerfully, but at the same time very, like, exactly to the point. A philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, who generally enjoyed Russian classics and he loved Russian classics. He also very greatly appreciated this novella, Hadji Murat, and he recommended this novella to his friends, and he said he even praised it higher than Tolstoy's novel Resurrection. And so we have this quotation from Ludwig Wittgenstein. He says, Tolstoy's philosophy seems the most correct to me when it is disguised uh, in, in his storytelling. As you can tell uh, later, very many uh, writers and philosophers as well uh, start to really appreciate this novella. And in modern literature, like in modern kind of reviews of this novella, you can often find that people are saying that this is like the peak and the top of uh, Tolstoy's realist writing. So that is it from me for today. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to Haji Murat. I hope it will help you to uh, better understand this novella, to better appreciate it, uh, to become interested, to read it, because I feel like it's not very often talked about. Like you, obviously, when you talk about Leo Tolstoy or Lev Tolstoy in Russian, you would uh, immediately war and peace, like in your mind, immediately war and peace, and then maybe Anna Karenina, and then maybe resurrection. Um, but his shorter works do not uh, spring to mind like immediately, right? Even though obviously he wrote a lot, uh, Haji Murat doesn't immediately spring to mind, uh, but. It didn't speak to my to my mind also immediately before. But luckily for me, I was watching an interview with uh, Yuri Narstein, who was a, who is a famous Russian animation director. Uh, he animated the uh, Hedgehog in Fog uh, and, uh, and his other works. And in in that interview, he mentioned that everybody should read Hadji Murat. Like he said, like I took the recommendation from Yuri Narstein. He was like, everybody has to read Hadji Murat. Uh, boys especially. Um, well, it's understandable why boys, because like it's very much about like a strong, um, resilient, um, honest man brings up those qualities in you. Like, you want these qualities in boys, right? But you also, obviously, you also want them in girls, <laughs> you know, for girls as well. Uh, so, yeah. Haji Murat, I hope you, I have inspired you to read it. I hope you will give it a read. It's a short read. Like, in this, it's just 200 pages, but it's a small book. Uh, so, I think in normal size, it's even shorter, like 100-something pages. So, definitely give Haji Murat a read. Uh, find a copy and highly recommend it. I hope you enjoy it and after you read it, let me know in the comments what you thought of it, if you enjoyed it, if you liked it as much as uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein or did you enjoy it as much as Yuri Narstein um, or, you know, so many other people. Maybe you didn't like it so much, then also let me know about that and why you didn't like it as much. And for now, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. It has been a long video, but I hope it was worth it. If you're still here, thank you for sticking around. <laughs> and yeah, have a great day. Go read Haji Murat. Let me know what you thought about it. And I will see you soon in my other videos. Yeah, have a good day. Thank you for watching. Bye.